Greetings, humanoids of the internet. My name is Bob, and this is episode 11 of Journey into Space. So, Journey into Space. Uh, today we are going to begin the process of launching an expedition to the polar regions of Duna by air. Uh, now we have a vehicle the Gorgon space plane that combines the features of interplanetary rocket and aircraft reasonably well uh, considering uh, but it's not really all that great of an airplane I want to put a dedicated uh, a specially designed aircraft into the atmosphere of Duna's polar regions without any having to make any significant design compromises for its interplanetary function in other words I, when it's, it's done I want to have an airplane that's just an airplane drop it into the atmosphere at Duna. Um, we're going to attempt it first to see if we can uh, uh, create a sort of carrier space plane for it. Uh, if that doesn't work out, uh, we're going to see if we can just launch it on top of a rocket. Uh, first things first though, uh, we want to first want to make an aircraft with excellent gliding and performance characteristics and then we'll figure out how to get it, get it to Duna. Um, first though, I want to take a sort of side road uh, through history to tell you about the mascot, mascot, if you will, of this uh, voyage. Uh, I want to tell you about the polar fart, and yes, I know what that sounds like. It's German chill out. Uh, the Polar Fart was an expedition taken, undertaken uh, by one of the greatest aircraft ever in history, and one of the most unknown. Uh, argu arguably the greatest aircraft that ever flew, and certainly the most romantic one. Uh, everyone knows about the Hindenburg, uh, one of the most epic fails in history, and they wonder smugly to themselves how anyone could think that a frail kite of a ship containing a big bag of explosive gas was ever going to be a winning proposition. Uh, what the average person doesn't know is that before there was a Hindenburg, there was the LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin. The Graf Zeppelin, arguably the single greatest aircraft that ever existed. The Graf Zeppelin operated from 1928 to 1937 and made 590 flights covering over a million miles without the loss of a single passenger's life or crew. Uh, in 1929, the Graf Zeppelin made the first ever around-the-world flight that carried paying passengers. This included the first ever non-stop flight across the Pacific. In 1931, the Graf Zeppelin embarked on an epic flight to the polar ice cap, originally intended to rendezvous with the uh, ill-fated polar ex exploration submarine Nautilus, uh, but instead uh, did a rendezvous with a Russian uh, icebreaker. Uh, the mission was a complete success. This is the polar fart. Uh, a fart meaning journey or travel. Um, uh, and uh, sadly, this historic craft met its ultimate fate not at the hands of weather or design flaws or explosive gases, uh, but because of the Nazi regime's need for aluminum during World War II, and because this regime held a grudge against Hugo Eckener, uh, the greatest airship captain ever and director of the Zeppelin Company, uh, who had anti-Nazi opinions. Uh, matter of fact, if Hugo Eckener wasn't one of the most famous and well-liked Germans who ever lived at that time, um, he probably would have wound up in a concentration camp. But, um, since he was 
famous and well loved by the German people. Uh, they couldn't do that, but they did destroy his ships. Uh, one of which was the uh, LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin, the greatest aircraft, arguably, that ever was. So uh, the um, the Graf is our m mascot for our series of uh, for our series of uh, videos, uh, which will uh, hopefully wind up with a polar expedition uh, to Duna. Nazis, damn Nazis! I hate them. I hate them. Okay, uh, this uh, this arrangement uh, where I have <laughs> yeah, the uh, engine on top. In the real world, uh, there's no there's no real problem with doing that. Uh, however, uh, physics uh, in the the Kerbal Space Program world not exactly the same as in the real world. So um, uh, typically, this kind of arrangement will cause the um, uh, ship to the airplane to spin around its um, pitch axis, um, but we're going to see how it goes. I've, I've pitched the uh, wings up at a very slight dihedral angle here, um, uh, and uh, I also uh, reinforced them selectively. I've, uh, closer to the body, I've put in more reinforcements, and then as I get further out, I put less, so so it will flex more at the wing tips, hopefully, than at the uh, the center. Um, so, but given the fact that this kind of scenario here with the uh, the engine on top could cause some serious problems in the Kerbal world, um, it may not work. We'll find out. This is the graph test one. Yeah, we've got Bart bit again. Okay. Looks like all the wings are touching. I'm only going to throttle it up a, a little, little bit over halfway. Uh, I, I don't want to. Don't want to overpower that. And I got no freaking control surfaces on this thing. Oh god! In flight, in flight. It's in here. I mean, I've got control surfaces at the back. I, I probably ought to have ailerons. I think. Might be good. Uh, I think Bartman was a fatality on some of our uh, tests of the uh, space plane. Okay, throttle up about that much. <laughs> it's flapping its wings. I'm really surprised I got off in one piece. It is kind of pushing the... Uh, it doesn't want to turn. No bueno. No bueno. I'm trying uh, uh, trying this this scenario at all because uh, I want to um, one put that closer to the center of um, of uh, gravity or center center of uh, weight, uh, and two I don't want to wind up having to put pods out here to uh, hang the control surfaces off of. Uh, so I'm maybe making things more difficult for me than I I really need to. But if it wasn't a bizarre craft, it wouldn't be fun. Uh, <laughs> break down, 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 down. That was uh, maybe a bad user error. Let's restart. Ah! 
Snap your wing. Snap those wings. Now you're thinking to yourself, this aircraft is totally retarded, and you're probably right. Uh, but um, the thing is, I don't uh, know how. How I assume that probably the atmosphere of Juno reacts similarly to atmospheric carbon. I don't know how subtle they've gotten with that. Um, but if the atmosphere is thin, and if it gives wings a problem, I want to have a, a big wingspan. I also want to try to avoid using fuel, and when big wingspan is going to help me with help me with that, hopefully. So. Let's see what we can do. This is flying on just his nose wheel right now. Actually, rendering or was rendering part of this video while I was recording the other part, so uh, uh, and uh, that just caused it to freak out. But I got that done with now. get down to about a thousand feet, uh, try to set the angle uh, right, see how long it takes him to, uh, to uh, glide unpowered. SAS is not the not the most uh, positive thing in the world. It's it's uh, doesn't doesn't try to sit you to one, one spot. It just tries to uh, it's like it just tries to control your uh, your rate of misdirection rather than actually keep you stuck in one direction. Okay, well obviously a little nose heavy. That's one thing. Let's see if that helps any. 
Actually, I want to get rid of that. No. I'm going to go with a mod part. Bartman! Bartman! say in the VAB in the uh, space plane hangar that it was nose heavy still it's still a little nose heavy well now there's really no point in having those there It's equally unstable in all directions. <laughs> Slightly tail heavy, seems like. Well, let me get my stopwatch going. All right. Well, this test might be a little bit, a bit boring, so we'll. We'll, uh, I'll stop recording and uh, I will uh, let you know when something, as usual, when something interesting happens. Okay, it's uh, like 15 minutes later and I'm only down to 889 feet, so um, I'm going to take it for granted that this is a pretty good glider. <laughs> um, but um, I guess our next step is to figure out some way... Uh, to make it fly that well, but not quite so retardedly, <laughs> you know, uh, something that flies well and manages to, to uh, fly, glides well and manages to fly well too, uh, because uh, you know, however well this glides, and it seems to glide really well, uh, it flies uh, really badly. You know, it does great as long as you point it in one direction and tell it to go, uh, but uh, try to move or anything, uh, it's not so good. Uh, so our next step is to see if we can do the same thing as far as gliding goes, but uh, with a less retarded um, controllability issues. Uh, so that's what we're going to do next. 
Okay, just for grins, I thought I'd see what happens if I just let it go on the way it was. It looks like it's about to land. Auto landing. They didn't do a thing. And we're all the way over here at the mountains. Well, maybe we'll try some brakes. Well, they got little small plants now. That's pretty cool. Okie dokie. Well, it glided real well. Um, it, uh, as far as, um, you know, any kind of flying characteristics go, it walled around like a big manatee. Uh, but once it get, gets going in a particular direction, it glides really great. Now we're going to see if we can repeat that, except with less suckage. <laughs> Introducing the ultimate in steampunk space technology, the, uh, the Duna biplane. How in the world I'm going to get this to Duna is is quite another matter, but uh, we will uh, <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, I guess. <laughs> okay, it'll throttle. I like the looks of it, though. Uh oh! Oh no! 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 Lift off. There we go. I had to change the, um, the angle here um, so that I could have the wings even. Um, so it's going to be a little, it's going to be pushing down the nose. And yeah, big time. Storm, yeah. Uh -oh. Okay, I had to come up with a fairly retarded way of fixing that problem, which is, well, I took away the pylon there, and then I also separated this from that, angled it up a little bit, and then connected it with a fuel line. So, uh, looks a little weird, but um, maybe it'll work. We'll find out. And again, I have no idea how, how I would actually think about taking that to Duna. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Uh, I'm actually going to take uh, to uh, do this from inside the cockpit, I think. Throttle up about halfway. There we go. That's weird. We got Hudby Kerman on the ground over there. Hudby Kerman is also on Lazy. It's kind of bizarre. Flies relatively decently. I mean, actually, flies relatively decently in terms of being maneuverable and stuff.
for the glide test. Okay, I'll catch up with you when we have some results. Okay, well as much as this uh, flies better, it's not as stable in long-term flight. Uh, I went away, it, um, surfed web for a while, and uh, came back and it was trying to do a death spiral. So uh, uh, it is not as uh, stable in long-term flight as the other one. Uh, so I think we're going to go back to the drawing board on that one. Okay, this is a peculiar creature, especially seeing as how these wing sections aren't even really connected. You can see right through them, but okay, whatever. It's Kerbal Physics. Let's give it a shot. Okay, well I don't find this particularly promising. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a glide test on it see how, see how it works. Okay, I've gone back to my original design and made some improvements. I uh, added some more struts kind of holding all these this up and um, added more control surfaces. So let's see how that works. is still not the prettiest flying airplane I've ever made. Let's uh, sit there to glide for a while. I'll start my stopwatch. See how long it goes. I am not exactly sure how this works. Um, uh, I started off this glide at uh, 1,000 meters uh, altitude. It's uh, almost nine minutes later, and it's at 2,000 meters altitude. <laughs> so I've, I've managed to invent an airplane that doesn't actually require fuel once it gets above up, up the ground, above the ground. Uh, so. Uh, so certainly as gliders go, uh, an aircraft that actually gains altitude without gas uh, is um, certainly a winner. Um, I guess, and it doesn't fly that badly. I mean, it doesn't fly great as far as maneuverability, but it doesn't fly that bad. So I guess the next step is to figure out how to get this thing to do now. It's not exactly the most uh, promising shape as far as that goes. Um, but it does appear, appear to be able to fly and gain altitude without any gasoline. <laughs> However weird that is. 
Okay. Okay, uh, still no engines. Uh, 13 minutes into it, and it's at 3,000 meters. I have invented the perpetual motion air aircraft. Not sure. Maybe these little paddles flapping back and forth is actually generating some kind of thrust. I don't know. Uh, but it apparently doesn't actually require any kind of actual fuel inputs on my part uh, to keep it going, which is good. That's, that's exactly what we were looking for. I mean, actually, it's more than we were looking for. Um, so it just keeps on going. This apparently can just keep on going, climbing slowly in the, altitude, in the uh, atmosphere almost forever. Uh, but uh, we need to uh, figure out how we're going to get this creation uh, to uh, do now. And our first uh, option is to try to create a, build a space plane around it uh, without screwing up its basic structure. Um, uh, and then failing that, we'll have to figure out, probably what will be even harder is to figure out how to put, a, put it on a rocket. That's probably impossible because there's just, I would, I would have to attach the rocket right there. And that's just not going to work. So I'm afraid I'm stuck, stuck uh, trying to figure out how to uh, create a carrier space plane for this thing. Uh, but as far as uh, flight characteristics go, can't beat a plane that manages to fly without fuel. That's pretty awesome. Okay, just for grins, uh, I let it fly on a little bit. Uh, now it's um, uh, 26 minutes in, and it's at 4,000 feet. So it is, it has climbed without fuel climb 3,000 feet. Um, so I would say its glide uh, characteristics are pretty good. Okay, I'm calling this the graph surprise because it'll be a huge ass surprise if this thing gets off the ground. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, look at the thing. It's a, it's a monstrosity. But uh, if I can get it into orbit, I think it'll be okay. Uh, it's just a matter of how we get it into orbit. Uh, and the uh, the design uh, airplane design uh, for Mars doesn't really didn't really allow a whole lot of latitude. I mean, it's not 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 a whole lot I could lot I could uh, do otherwise, uh, but that. Um, so we will see how it goes. Bardbin, Bardbin man, I kind of feel sorry for you, dude. All right, that's messed up. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> it is messed up. I only got four jet engines on this thing. I hope, I hope that's enough. I'm not even trying to steer it because I can't see how that's going to end well. It's in the air. I'll be damned. That is the most bizarre looking monstrosity I've ever actually managed to get airborne. question that is the most bizarre thing I have ever managed to get to actually work it's just weird man it's like some kind of freakish freakish steampunk biplane or something rocket powered steampunk biplane but so far it is working amazingly amazingly it works what the hell, man? Check that shit out. What the fuck? My god, what have I done? Alright, we'll keep on climbing here and uh, see what it does when I let these big candles down here. See if that screws the pooch. Okay, for some reason the uh, the ship spontaneously blew itself up when I fired up the rocket engines. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Uh, let's take a look. 
Let's see. Okay, the fuel tank, Angra fuel tank collided into the uh, FL T200. Still, the damn thing flew. That's amazing. Uh, if, okay, I probably need to. Uh, yeah, I need to reinforce this these connections here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and do that. I also a uh, thing I, I remember that I didn't do uh, is um, I wanted to put some jettisonable parachutes on 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 the plane just in case I have some trouble slowing down. But I have to make them jettisonable. Uh, so we will see what we can do about that, and I will catch up to you when I'm ready to start again. Okay, I think I know what uh, went wrong. Uh, these uh, fuel tanks here uh, are very funny about clipping with other objects, and uh, it was clipping with this uh, fuel tank here. So I am thinking that now it will behave, but now I've got these, these three pylons here. I mean, you know, if, if that's not going to be floppy, I don't know what will be. Um, so I don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, I guess we'll find out. Bartbin. Bartbin, you have been evading death like crazy today. Wink. Oh, shit. Uh, that can't be good, man. All right, well, what the hell? I mean, it's not even not even sitting level. Uh, it's probably going to be a redesign, but let's find out. Uh, staging. All right, that wasn't good. Okay, here we go again. Bartman was smiling for some reason right before he died. I have no idea why. Some weird, ridiculous joke on the universe. But he was smiling when he died. That was weird. Okay. Let's restart. I think I tried to lift off too soon. He's smiling again. That's weird. Dude. Okay. I must have screwed up the uh, balance somehow. but it works using those JTO type 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 deals it's not pretty but it gets the thing off the ground
<laughs> looks like a rocket ship made by the Wright brothers, man. Seriously. That looks very 19th century. Okay, I will uh, catch up with you when I'm ready to fire up the rockets and hopefully they won't explode the ship this time. I have to say this whole thing is terribly Jules Verne, isn't it? I mean, look at it. It doesn't look like a, a, a high-tech space plane. It looks like something Jules Verne came up with. Totally. Okay. Well, let's see if uh, Mr. Verne uh, has... Um, knows his uh, engineering here. About uh, 12,000 meters. We're going to kick in the uh, engine. They're going to try to uh, throttle down first. Uh, then kick in the engines, then throttle back up slowly. Because these engines are actually fairly powerful. Those are 600 thrust units each. So. may have to scale down the uh, thrust on that. It may simply be too powerful for the uh, for the aircraft. Okay, almost ready. Okay, throttle down a bit. <laughs> that was a failure. Okay, maybe we'll we'll scale down the thrust on that. No, that wasn't my intention. Why does that not separate? That was weird. Okay, you don't have permission to lose control here. Or to fly up upside down. Okay, alright. Add the SAS on. Okay, we're going to scale back the uh, thrust a bit. Okay, we got a new Kerbal now, Raymore. Uh, one that I haven't seen yet, I've seen before. And hopefully this won't be his last flight. I took off that booster thing altogether. Um, figuring it was more trouble than it's worth. Uh, hopefully it will be able to take off. We'll see. Start the video when uh, we're at getting ready to fire off these engines, which hopefully won't cause a catastrophic failure like the last ones did. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to reconsider my methods. Okay, I had to replace the um, uh, aero spikes with thrust vest vectoring engines, uh, but they have less thrust, so it's not a foregone conclusion that th it's going to work. It's going to get us to orbit. We just have to see. No, no. Okay, we had a um, staging issue last time. Uh, that's been resolved. And hopefully uh, all will go well, maybe. <laughs> like I was about to say before, I've got um, thrust factoring engines on these things um, uh, because it, it, even the RCS wasn't um, keeping it on uh, track with the um, aerospikes. But, um, but there's no guarantee that it has enough power to get us to orbit.
Okay, here we go again. Okay, I finally broke down and decided to bring it into the uh, VAB, uh, and I call this the Graph Wishbone, because you look at the middle of it. <laughs> there's nothing there until you get to the space plane. Uh, so I'm thinking probably there's a good chance it'll just pull right in the middle, uh, apart right in the middle, like a Thanksgiving wish wishbone, uh, a wishbone at the Thanksgiving table. Uh, it's probably a, a reasonable likelihood of that, and it'll just spread its legs and pull apart. Big as hell, uh, but um, uh, I have a fallback plan if that happens. Um, so uh, we will see if I need the fallback plan. Yeah, I don't think this is gonna work, <laughs> but we'll see. This is like launching a sparrow on top of a Saturn V. SAS on. And three, two, one. Oh, that's wobbly. Okay, I guess plan B. <laughs> it did rip up the middle, but uh, but it also didn't. Uh, it has a major wobbliness problems. Okay, the graph wishbone two. Step in the right direction. <laughs> Look at him wobbling. Oh, that was not what I had in mind. Okay. <laughs> Staging issue. Once again, hopefully staged right this time. Throttle to maximum, SAS on. In three, two, one. So far, so good. Okay, 
stay unstable. Let's tilt her over. Not climbing too fast, but uh, I'll take it. I don't have any RCS on this because I figured the uh, these engines are thrust vectoring, so I was hoping that they would uh, keep it all fairly stable. We're getting there, just getting there slow. This tank's almost empty. Okay, time to uh, tilt it over a bit more. Over a bit more. actually get this albatross in orbit. Who knows? half that tank left. And once I get into orbit, it doesn't matter. I've got uh, plenty of fuel for the nuclear.
Okay, wonder of wonders, we have actually achieved orbit. Alrighty, well we'll uh, stop there for right now, and next episode we will proceed on to Duna. To the polar ice caps. To do our polar fart. Alrighty, that's all for now.